have already started electrodynamics, but I noticed that I have forgotten to tell you still few things about um, about uh, wave equations. So maybe I will give some more tutorial, mathematical tutorial about wave equations, and then I will continue. So first thing is the following that wave equation, yeah? We may consider wave equation which is uh, d uh, over dx square phi equal d star over d t square phi where at the moment I forget about my strict convention that t is tau measured in second whereas tau is the same time but measured in say I don't know light years or so in principle when I was want to be very very strict I should use this letter tau but I believe that you already understand that this is only a matter of convention so we may rewrite this equation in the following way that I may put psi dot I will denote by another letter and now pi dot which is nothing but phi double dot here is equal or, or maybe yeah it doesn't matter I have written this in, in uh, two dimensions but normally it is just a Laplacian yeah in any case it takes only space derivative so this is and then to take to consider it as a ordinary differential equation for what? Not for three degrees of freedom, not for six degrees of freedom if we have two particles, not even for uh, Avogadro number of degrees of freedom if we consider the amount of all particles in one mole of the gas, for instance, but infinitely many, because all these degrees of freedom depend upon x, yeah? So we have infinitely many degrees of freedom, phi at each point, and also phi in each point, and we may say, okay, but in fact what counts is this time derivative, which means that if I know phi and pi initial data, then I am able to reconstruct uh, the value of this phi in a different uh, type. And of course you already know that it is possible because I have even shown you the uh, correct formulae for the solution. But now let us assume the attitude of a computer man. <laughs> of course a computer man always uh, discretizes everything, yeah? He cannot um, describe infinitely many degrees of freedom, yeah? Instead of a function, continuous value of, a, of the function, he may use uh, discrete number of points, yeah? x, k, and he would replace derivatives by differences, yeah? And this is the standard attitude, of course, for, for example, those of you who <coughs> is interested in uh, gravitational waves, you probably have seen those beautiful pictures produced by those computer people which nicely 
illustrate the evolution, the, the, this phenomenon of merging of two black holes. Yeah? It was somehow calculated on the computer by discretization and replacing derivatives by differences. Of course, this is a very tricky subject because if you really want to get a nice picture, you, may, you must take into account very, very short discretization you need. Let us consider this as a constant A, right? And of course, uh, there is a whole technology how to do, but let us stick to the naive point, for instance. What is uh, uh, the... Okay, let me switch again to two dimensions. So we have x and, and pi. Yeah? Here we have x. And instead of continuous x, we have some discrete value of which I number by k. Yeah? So x1, x2, and so on and so on. Instead of time derivative, we we'll have also discrete amount of times. Yeah? So instead of, of the first derivative, dx phi, what we should replace in phi? Ah, simply phi of at the point xk. This is some, for, for example, f of, of x k plus 1 minus 5 of x k divided by a. Yeah? It, this is a good approximation of the derivative. Yeah? But actually, we could as well take uh, x k minus x k minus 1. Yeah? It is equally good. And how do we describe second derivative in this discretizing, uh, discretized mode? Ah, we would, if, if I want to say what does it mean second derivative here, I would take first derivative here, first derivative here, and again subtract them, divide by a, yeah? So this can be understood as uh, the value of phi prime at the point k plus, x k plus one half a, yeah? Because this is described the, the mean value here, yeah? Whereas this is the mean value of the derivative here. Therefore, I would assign it to x k, k minus one half a. This is very naive, of course, and if you really want to get such pictures which were used by Kip Thorne to convince the American um, legislature to pay 10 billion dollars for the observation of gravitational waves, then of course it, it is too naive. You must use much better approximation. But this is a not bad approximation, and in many uh, in many problems it is sufficient. Yeah, this is x k plus one. Not a function. The bracket is put the function. Phi x k minus. 
Ah, oh, sorry, excuse me, excuse me, of course, excuse me. Yeah, of course. So, the conclusion, the second derivative at xk would be something like this minus that, divided again by a, yeah? So, this is 1 over a square, yeah? Because there is, and now this minus that. So, phi at x k plus 1 uh, plus phi at kx k minus 1 and minus twice minus 2 times phi at the point xk okay and this is indeed if you for instance use the Tyler Tyler uh, expansion and you represent uh, the values by the Tyler expansion up to second order, so this becomes just the correct form. Okay, so the computer man could say the following. If I know the values of P at all points K and the values of phi at all points at XK, so I will, so the, the evolution equation will be the following, the phi at point T L plus 1 x k will be the, the, the derivative will be phi at the point T k, uh, T L x k plus the derivative, yeah, plus a times pi at the point t l x k, yeah. So this is a realization of that equation, yeah, that the derivative in time is equal to pi, right? And the same here, pi. At the, at the next time point, tl plus 1, xk, is equal pi at the point l, xk, plus a times this Laplacian calculated at the point t, uh, t uh, L X K Laplacian or in two dimensions Laplacian is nothing but the second derivative and for the second derivative we plug precisely this formula okay which means that if we know <coughs> phi and pi this is like Q in mechanics, this is like momentum in mechanics, so if we know position and momentum at given instant of time, then I, must, my, I may uh, calculate its value in the next instant of time and so on and so on, and this way it works. It really works. For many, of course, if you want to have very good approximation, then you must use many points and relatively small a and so on. But this method works. This method really works. And this is the main idea to solving partial differential equations by computer.
But now, very important remark. And I would like to tell you something which you should, should remain, uh, remember till the very end of your life. Because from, the, from this point of view, yeah. the computer man really think about partial differential equations this way. Very, not very theoretical, but very practical, and they are really able to do something. But from this point of view, what is the difference between plus and, for instance, if I put minus? For a computer man, it doesn't mean anything interesting. You just, instead of this plus, you will put minus and so on. At the first glance, you don't see any difference. But the difference is enormous. And whereas this procedure on the computer is meaningful and it's used, it is used really, because observe that this equation is nothing but the Laplace equation, yeah? Formally. Initial value problem for the Laplace equation is a nonsense. You will see it in a while. I will show you why. So solving initial value problem for the wave equation is a good procedure, and when discretized, it really works, works on the computer. Now, just this small difference, changing plus or minus, changes completely the properties of this problem, and the initial value problem for the Laplace equation becomes a nonsense, which I will show you soon, which means that if the computer man will, uh, will try to solve it this way, just changing this plus and minus, he will get completely crazy uh, results and let me prove it. <clears throat> okay, so suppose that I have a Laplace. I will remain on two dimensions because everything is simple, but it doesn't depend upon the dimension. The same phenomenon occurs in any dimension. Uh, and uh, Laplace. So, I equal to zero, which means uh, B2 over D, T, or I will write, instead of T, I will write Y, <laughs> because the, this is the plus D2 over Dx squared equal yeah equal here so tr try to solve this equation uh, this uh, the initial value problem for me. so let me choose the following f of x which is equal the initial value for phi let me put sine of n x I do not specify what is n. In the future, n will be great. And the initial value for the momentum, which means phi dot at 0 x, let me simply put 0. This is just an example. I have shown you the way how to solve initial value problem, but 
So you may, by the way, try to solve it for uh, for the wave dimension. Yeah, for wave dimension, it is easy to solve. Please solve it as a uh, homework. It is easy. You just plug this data into the formula which we have. But now try to do it for Laplace equation and I will not develop any uh, but it is very easy to observe that the following function phi of t x equal hyperbolic cosine of m y times hyperbolic uh, then side of n x fulfills Laplace equation. Do you see? Because if I differentiate twice the cosine, I will get back the same cosine where I, with n squared, because each differentiation gives me n. So if I differentiate it twice, I will get n squared times the same function. Whereas, if I differentiate with respect to x, sine after two differentiation comes back with minus sine. And again, n squared. Therefore, these two terms will cancel, and it really is a, this function is a harmonic function. It, yeah? Okay. Now, let me put 1 over n here. Oh, so it is very easy. The equation is linear, so, right? And now, let me go to uh, infinity with n. So, when n goes to infinity, this value tends to zero, of course, yeah, because sine is zero. And, but, by the way, you also see that this uh, initial condition is fulfilled, yeah, because the hyperbolic cosine is an uh, even function, so it has uh, derivative equals zero and zero. But, so of course uh, zero, this is one, and this is small. But they, uh, oh yeah, excuse me, there is no, t, t has been replaced by, by y, of course I could keep t as well, but I just want to that you remember that whenever time, really time, enters into account, the correct equation is wave equation, whereas here, no. Okay, so take this value for even very small y. What happens if n tends to infinity? When n tends to infinity, this tends to what? This tends to infinity, but cosine is an exponential function, yeah? Exponential fu function grows extremely fast. It grows faster than any power of n, yeah? So it tends to infinity. Which means that if initial data are as small as possible, you, I can take n equal 1 over million, if you wish, or 1 over billion, then after a tiny, a very tiny uh, interval of time, 
the value of the solution will be as big as you wish. Yeah? So this is a nonsense because the discrete approximation never takes into account the actual value of the initial value. But in order this procedure to, to be reasonable, it must, the, the result must depend smoothly upon the initial condition. And we see that it doesn't depend smoothly. Yeah? Even if initial conditions are very, very... Now, somebody can say, ah, okay, if maybe the value tends to zero, but derivatives, for instance, first derivative will be just cosine and will not be, uh, tend to zero. But instead, I can put n to 10th power. Then, not only the value of this function tends to zero, but also the first nine derivatives go to zero. Okay, then, the derivative number 10 will be relatively big, but at least the function with its first nine derivatives goes to zero. And nevertheless, this 10 doesn't help. This goes to, to infinity because the exponential function tends to infinity faster than any power, any power of n. So you see that th this procedure is highly sensitive upon the initial data. And it is not true that if I make a tiny error in measuring initial data, then the result uh, will get a tiny error. No, it will get an enormous error. But we never measure anything without any error. We always do some errors. And if the procedure is so much sensitive on errors, it means that it is useless. Of course, I may formulate 10 other um, theorems, mathematical theorems, why this, the initial value problem for Laplace equation is a nonsense, but I will stop here. I believe that this observation really shows that the initial value problem for elliptic equation is a nonsense. So just remember that if you have elliptic equation, the only reasonable way to solve it is to try to solve boundary value problem. On the other hand, the boundary value problem is a nonsense for hyperbolic equation. For hyperbolic equation, the only reasonable procedure is to solve initial value problem. Okay. So I think that this, anybody who is using field theory in his research must, must be aware of this fact. Okay, this is the simple observation I wanted to, to tell you. Okay, now slowly, slowly we move towards the correct Einsteinian version of electrodynamics. We know already its Maxwell version and we already know that it is incompatible with the Galileo inv uh, invariance. Yeah? Because from one point of view, if there is some current, there must be uh, magnetic field around it, whereas if we move to, uh, together with this current, we do not observe any current and therefore the magnetic field 
should be absent, which is a, an obvious contradiction. And only the Einsteinian version of, of space-time improves this disease. Okay, so slowly, slowly we move, but for that purpose I would like to make a very short tutorial, say, in differential geometry. Don't be afraid that it will not get too much into, into formalism. However, I want to present the notation which I am going to use. Probably most, most of you have already some ability to use, to use this notation. So, when we deal with non-flat geometry, very often differential geometry is understood as a theory of tensors. Ah, tensors. When I was young, this magic word, tensors, ah, it was something. But I will, let me be, begin with vectors. So I already told you that a vector to first order differential operators. So this is a formal definition, but uh, whenever we have a coordinate system, because we are working on geometric structures which mathematicians call uh, differential um, manifold differential manifold. What is a differential manifold? It is a set which may be parameterized by finite number of real, uh, of real coordinates in such a way that the transition from one such parameterization, which is often called uh, map, is sufficiently smooth. Yeah? Which means that if we have two such coordinate systems, then one of them can be treated as a smooth function of the other ones and vice versa. Yeah? If we have an atlas and we have a one map and the other map, then the transition from one parameterization to the other is smooth. Those places where they overlap. Yeah? So this is, of course, what I am telling you in in very naive way may be fully uh, formalized, but I'm not going to go too much into formal mathematical language, so I believe that I will if I remain on the level of, of such naive explanation, you will understand what happens. So now, there is a theory. Those first order differential operators are, for instance, of, of this type. Moreover, any vector is a combination of that. Therefore, if I have a vector, it is a combination and, uh, uh, and I the expansion coefficients I may call this way the summation of course is taken into account in old textbooks in differential geometry the vector was 
considered as a set of its components. But then it, uh, we were forced to understand how do you transform these coefficients when we pass to the other system of coordinates. But if I use, I, I hate this kind of, uh, of notation. For me, first order uh, vector, a vector is a first order differential operator. It may, whenever I choose a coordinate system, then it may be expanded with respect to that because this, this is a first order differential operator and there is a theorem, they form a basis. Any other can be expanded with respect to them, which means that if I have any vector, there is a unique expansion. And now, if somebody wants to tell me how to pass to the new yeah, uh, coordinates, I will tell the following. I know how to, how to represent the derivative with respect to x is by derivative with respect to y. I have done it on this blackboard or in the other room already a couple of times and this was, uh, you did not protest. I believe that you understand it good. So it is xk and now instead of that I write that dl over the uh, y huh? and here is the yl over dxk. Okay? This is obvious. This is just the theorem about differentiation of a composite fu function. Yeah? It is obvious. And now this means that these are precisely those expansion coefficients of the same vector, but with respect to the new basis. Yeah? So you already have the formula. So these are vectors. Now, the vectors act on functions. If I have a vector x, how does it act on a function? Oh. This is a first order differential operator. Therefore, xk df over dxk. Yeah? This is It is, and this expression, of course, everything which, what I am doing here, I do separately in every point of this. Yeah, everything is meant at a single point. Of course, this one or this one doesn't matter, but. This is, yeah. okay, so if I fix f, the value of that depends upon a vector. So this is a linear, linear function of vectors, because on this formula, you may uh, you may look the following: that x is fixed, and I change f. 
Of course, and this is correct. But now I propose you to analyze this formula in a different way. F is fixed, and I change vectors. No? For a given function f. No? So this is a Linear functions on vectors are called covectors. Linear function on vector is a covector by the definition. Linear function on vector. depends upon point, so it is also a function. Now, I have defined that there is a differential of a function. This is a definition of a differential. Therefore, I know what is dxk. So this theorem tells you that when, whenever I have a coordinate system, the differentials of those coordinates span the space of covectors, which is very often the space of vectors is often called tangent space, whereas the dual space is often called cotangent space. So this is a basis of, of a tangent space. And this is a basis of a cotangent space. I apologize for this talk, this lecture in differential geometry, even if this is supposed to be a 
lecture in physics, namely, but I really need it because then the, all the uh, this electrodynamics becomes simple in this notation. You see, I have already mentioned during my probably first or second lecture that all books are extremely thin, thick. If you take Newton's book, Principia, it is like that. And the material, I was teaching uh, classical mechanics many times in my life. So the material contained in Newton's book took me two lectures, roughly speaking. Why? Because we now have very good notation. Every uh, formula, mathematical formula, which I used during my talk, also here, in Newton's book it would take three pages. We are, you, we are already well trained in mathematical formulae during the first years of your physical studies. You study mainly calculus and algebra, yeah? And this is precisely this language which enables us to shorten this terribly long book. Okay, so good notation is very good language is really very, very good. Okay, so this is why I... So, whenever I have a differential manifold, this means that locally I may parameterize all the points by real coordinates. I'm not entering into uh, yeah. complex because complex manifolds is something even more complicated I skip it but for us physicists especially the real manifolds are, are necessary okay so you see when I have a manifold M so M it is my favorite uh, letter for the manifold, not because it is manifold, but because of Minkowski, because we physicists, we mostly use uh, the, the, the manifold with whom we have to do, mostly, is the, the Minkowski or the space-time, the first naive model of space-time was the Minkowski space. Yeah? So, at each point we have, a, if M is a point at M, so a this is a space-time, this is a point of space-time which the physicists call event, yeah? at each event we have a tangent space, which means a vector space of all vectors attached at this point, and we also have a dual space, namely the space of covectors. And if we choose, we may choose different coordinates, of course, and the Freedom to, to use different coordinates is very is very important in physics, yeah? But we know how to translate our formulae from one coordinate system to the other coordinate system for vectors. Soon I will write the corresponding formula for uh, covectors. So we know how to switch between them and these are linear functions of vectors and vice versa. Vectors may be understood as linear 
functions on covectors. Th this duality is a very important feature of this geometric language. Okay, let me go back to this formula. Okay, so I'm not going, of course, to prove the theorem and so on. This is just I'm almost sure that all this you perfectly know, but maybe in slightly different notation. But I want to introduce this notation because it makes things, physical formula, much more, much simpler. Yeah. Okay, so now, just before I go further, let me This can be treated as a transformation law for components of, of a vector. Yeah? If we pass from one coordinate to the other. So now let us calculate the transformation law not for components of a vector but of a covector. Yeah? So we want to write down it as uh, dxl in, in no, sorry dyl do you see the formula this is very easy how do we calculate the total differential of dxl so first i times dx, uh, dxk over dyl, yeah? differential of a function x, of, of any function with respect to the coordinate system y. If instead of xk I, I put f, this is df over dxl times dyl. Yeah. This formula you know perfectly. By the way, the first time when I was studying physics, the first time that this formula was taught to, to me was the first laboratory in physics. Because they were teaching us that the error of a value f is df over dyl times the error of the observable d. Yeah? And of course this is precisely the same formula. Yeah? Okay. So if you agree with this formula, so finally, x, k, okay, and this is nothing but the expansion coefficient of the same covector alpha with respect to the new coordinates, so I will call it L. So you see that in the transformation law, for, for the vector, what enters is this Jacobian, yeah? the, the table of derivatives of new, vector, new coordinates with respect to old coordinates, whereas for the, uh, in the transformation law for a covector, the inverse matrix enters into the game, namely the the Jacobian composed of derivatives of old with respect to new. Now, just for some object, for some reasons, in 19th century they had a feeling that this is more important than that one, and therefore this object they called covariant and 
these objects were called contravariant because they transform with the use of contra, of, of the inverse matrix. But of course this terminology, which still remains valid, namely vectors are called contravariant tensors, whereas covectors are called covariant tensors. This is a terminology which is still used, and I will also use it, the body, but you must be aware of the fact that this terminology was just, it could be equal, <laughs> inverse. Because this is just what, which one of the matrices, dx over dy over or, the, or dy over dx, you treat as more important. Okay, in any case, these transformation formulae are simple because we have transformation formulae for differentials and we have a transformation formulae for the derivatives. So it is very easy to have. Okay. And now finally we come ah an exercise. An exercise. Let us calculate the value of dx number k over the vector d over dx number j, for instance. An exercise. Just to drill our abilities in using this language. So this is exactly. So, how this object, the differential, forget about the this x k. This is just a function. Forget about the x k. Treat it as a function. How the differential was derivative. The action of a differential on a vector was just the, the, the derivative of this function with respect to that vector. So this is d over dxj of this function. And by the way, this function is now xk, right? How much is it? The derivative number three, when differentiated with respect to, the, to the coordinate number two is how many? Zero. It is only non-zero where k is equal to j, right? So this symbol is nothing but the Kronecker delta. You understand it? The algebra is, I'm sure you have studied it on your first year of studies during the uh, course of linear algebra. When you have a vector space and a base in it, and you have the dual space, namely space of vectors, and a base in it, and those bases fulfill this identity. So you say that this base is dual with respect to that. And vice versa, this base is dual with respect to that. Okay. I believe 
is the time we stop. Here, but now I let us. Yeah, excuse me. Shall we make some break or we continue? Because I am ready to continue and then finish earlier. Because previously I was cheating a little bit and uh, the talk was too long. But now I am not going to cheat. I am going to finish on time. Can we continue? Okay, so we continue. Okay. So, tensors. It is a bit ridiculous because all of you perfectly know what are tensors, but this is just I'm just introducing a simple language, and with this language, every, the life will be easier, or at least our life. So, tensor. First, let me consider covariant tensors. So, a tensor T is a multilinear mapping that if you put a multilinear function. upon this one is linear. If you multiply this by 5, this number 5 will go, the, the, the result will be 5 times bigger. If you put here two vectors, then the result will be a sum of two results. The first one, if you put the first one and the second if you put this. You know what does it mean, multilinear. Okay. But if you plug every of these vectors, maybe span with respect to x, i, and so on, x, n d over d x i but excuse me such a formula is forbidden in my language why because i may happen in one formula only twice up and down and then so this is an illegal formula why because i am I don't have enough numbers because n may exceed the number of letters in my alphabet. Therefore, instead of I, K, I will use I1, I2, no, this is I number n, the last one. This you understand, yeah? And now, because of the linearity, all those numbers, because these are numbers, yeah? Here is summation. May be put outside, go outside, so it is. A component 
number xy of the first vector, the component number of the second, and so on, the component number n. Uh -huh. And what remains here is the value of t on those elements of the base d over dx ij d over dx i2 and so on d over d over n and this is what we call a component of a tensor number i1 I2 and so on, I n. In all textbooks, a tensor was just such a table, the collection of all their, uh, of all the, uh, now the collection of all the components. But it is much better because you get those components once you choose a coordinate system. But the tensor does not depend upon co choice of coordinate system. If we choose coordinate system, then we get a useful way to describe this tensor in terms of those numbers. Yeah? But the tensor, but if you want to calculate the um, transformation coefficients you, you do like previously you just check uh, you just expand every d over dx with respect to d over dy you put the coefficients outside and you will get the formula for, for the transformation so it is very easy. I am not going to do that because surely you are, you know how to do that. I only want to draw your attention that this is just the possible description of tensor. So a uh, covariant tensor is a multilinear function of vector. And which may be parametrized by those by the collection of its components, and naturally, in my notation, they get the indices downstairs. Yeah, because they are downstairs here. Okay. Now the second. Contravariant ah, examples. You already know the examples. For instance, uh, metric tensor, which I have already mentioned. It is just a contravariant tensor of rank 2 because it has two slots. You put two vectors. And it produces a number which we call a scalar product of those two numbers. Therefore, its coordinate description is G with two lower indices. Right? And what is this? It is G of two vectors of basic vectors. Yeah? That's all. And this formula, of course, gives you immediately the, the transformation law. If you want to describe it, to, uh, to calculate the components of the same metric G in a new system of coordinates, you plug, you expand those d over dx in terms of d over dy, and immediately you get what you need. Okay.
Now, contravariant, because of this duality, you see, you see there is always a duality, vectors, covectors. So the same, but uh, multi, uh, multi, multi linear functions. On, on the covectors, just because everything what is contravariant is dual to, to everything which is covariant. <coughs> on, uh, on, on covectors. So again, it is a black box with many slots, but to those slots we plug not vectors, but con uh, um, uh, covectors, yeah? Alpha 1, alpha n. And it eats those covectors and produces a number. But because every covector may be expanded with respect to basis, yeah? so the co expansion coefficient I will call this way, dx, i1, and so on. I n, dx, i n. And now, because of linearity, everything uh, all those coefficients goes outside, yeah? So alpha the component number i1 of the first vector, vector and so on. Finally the component number i n of the nth vector. And what remains is the value on this basis. D x i1 d x i n and this number because this is a number is often called the the component of this tensor with those indices i1, i n. Right? And this is a contravariant tensor. So the contravariant tensor may always be understood as a black box which eats covectors and produces numbers. Specific example of a, uh, of a uh, covariant tensor is a covariant vector, which means covector, and, and so on. Everything is, is simple. Now, among those vectors, we may also consider such which have a specific symmetry. For instance, we know that G is not just an arbitrary covariant vector of uh, rank 2, but symmetric. G is always symmetric. Yeah? But we can as well consider those which are anti-symmetric and precisely. All this introduction is because electromagnetic field in electromagnetics it tends, turns out that it is a covariant anti-symmetric uh, tensor. Anti-symmetric tensor and due of that all these formulae become very easy to calculate the transformation 
laws for for that and okay. Uh, so I believe that So to summarize this in slightly different way, I may say that uh, covariant tensor is always dx i1 the vectors so the first one it, because this is a covector if I so this is the first entry this is the second entry and so on this is the, the last entry yeah because the covector is something which eats a vector and produces a number now for for the in mathematics, of course, when I write these two objects together, I should this gives me something else, yeah? This is not just a multiplication. It is a multiplication of results. When I have two vectors, I will put x1 into this one, x two into the other one, of course then I will sum and, and so on, but I will multiply the results. Okay, this object, this and that, is just a tensor of second rank, but then I add, so this thing very better the mathematician calls te a tensor product. So what is a tensor product? Uh, this one is a black box with one entry. This again is a ten, uh, uh, is a this is a covector, which means a black box with one entry, the other entry, and we put them together, and now it becomes a composed black box with with two entries where we say whenever this produces some number, this produces some number, then we multiply those numbers. Yeah? So the, this is precisely what is tensor product. This is just the mathematical notation. Whereas kova A contravariant tensor is the same, but not which is built of dx i one dx i two d over d x i n not i2 but i okay and with some coefficients s i1 to i n and how do we un how do we understand this this is just a black box 
which eats covectors, because a vector may be considered as a linear function on covector. So if I put a covector here, it produces a number. When I put another covector here, it produces a number. And in this notation, I want that, uh, that this produces a number on two covectors. So the mathematicians use such a symbol, which means tensor product, which from two black boxes, each of them with one entry, produces a black box with two entries. So this means that the result of the action of that on that and the other result gets multiplied. And, and then, of course, the enters also the other one. So any contravariant tensor is of that type. Okay. And the last notation, the last notation which I want to introduce is uh, wedge. A, B. So it, it, from the definition, it is an anti-symmetric product. So, so this is A, B minus B, A. Tensors, vectors, and anything which which were used here. Uh, so by using the first definition in the upper part of the black border, so we by using that definition we find the components of tensors. Yes. Then we represent the uh, in coordinate system. Yeah. Yes. 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 But but here I may a priori I do not use any component of, of it. Because this is just in something which eats covectors. Mm -hmm. yeah? Of course, when I calculate that, in, it depends in a specific way. But upon the, yeah. Okay, so for instance, now the main claim is that electromagnet. So the electromagnetic electromagnetic field is a covariant. Anti-symmetric tensor of order two, so I will write two tensor, which means that F is somehow F. I J D X. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Space time, because everything. Is a covariant. Is a space time covariant. Therefore. Covariant uh, space time derivative, I will use mu dx mu, and the definition is mu. Mm. So, any, and now, 
for the tensor, I should use this object. But uh, anti-symmetric means that it must be anti-symmetric, yeah? Therefore, never such object without that uh, appears. So the correct, the correct formulation is like that. This is an electromagnetic field, and we are going to, yeah? So it has, so F mu nu, F mu nu, first of all, It is anti-symmetric. You see, very often physicists try to avoid mathematical notation and they write it this way. But they assume that it is anti-symmetric. And then, of course, if this is anti-symmetric, so here, if we split it into anti-symmetric and symmetric part, the symmetric part, which is summed with anti something anti-symmetric, goes away. Yeah? So I prefer to keep this because this is easier. Moreover, moreover, such anti-symmetric covariant tensors form a very, very important, the most important category of, uh, of tensors, which is very often used differential forms, and there are uh, they have very nice um, structure, so I really want to keep the fact that these are differential forms. Okay. So first of all, this is anti-symmetric. Therefore, as a table of so two by two, so all the components may be written in terms of uh, as, a, as a matrix. Of course, it is anti-symmetric from the very beginning, therefore it has zeros here. And now, he interprets, so zero is time, so this co corresponds to x zero, which is time, and this corresponds to x k, which is x y z, yeah? the space coordinate. How many independent components has such a such a if we all together we have here sixteen uh, four by four sixteen places. We have already put four zeros, what remains? 10 places. However, those among those 10, there are three here and three here. So it is six. Sixteen minus four is not ten; it is twelve. Excuse me. So we have, we have twelve places, namely 
three here and three here. But because of the anti-symmetry, what is here, the same thing happens here with the sign minus. So three independent. And also we have three places here, which must repeat, be repeated here with minus sign. So altogether we have only six independent parameters, which precisely correspond to three uh, to six components, three for electric, three for magnetic field. And namely, here we have minus A1, minus A2, minus A3, and here, of course, A1, A2, A3. And what is here? We put I must, I must remember what is this is number, so it is one, three, one, three, so it is minus B2 plus B2 minus, and now must be B2 minus B1. I remember this formula in the following way that this is no, this formula uh, there are errors I will soon uh, repair this error but I remember that this is d d t times e plus where E is a covector, E equal E k d x k. Therefore, minus, this is the row number zero, and here minus E, so this is correct. Minus E1 and so on, and now B is equal Epsilon K L M contains a zero and those which do not contain. Those which contain zero 
are always of that form. dx0, and there must be something which does not contain x0, therefore it is a three-dimensional element. Yeah? And that's all. And the components which do not contain zero. The component which do not contain zero is a two-form in three dimensions. Now, a two-form in three dimensions contains two d axes and we may parameterize by the uh, by the one which is missing. If here is 1 and 2, then we call it B1. We know 1 and 2, so we call it B3. All the two forms in three dimensions may be parameterized but by the missing view. Because, of course, if, if in many dimensional uh, space you want to list a two form, then you list which axes appear. But in three, if uh, I list uh, an n-1 form, it is much easier to list those which do not appear here. Okay, so this is like that. So what is B1? B1 is a component where this is 2, 3. So where is B1? B1 is number uh, 2 because this is row, uh, the line number 2 and this is line number 3. So B1. Okay. Right? Now, where we, I meet B2? B2, if k is 2, then the positive number is what? 2, 3, 1. So 3, 1. So let us take row number 3 and in 1 must be B uh, because this is 0, 1, 2, 3 3, 1, something wrong. Yeah, that was B2. And, and then. 2, where is 2? But 2, 1. Excuse me, I just finished. One, it is where it is two, three, two, three, two, three. I know, so it is, com I am completely wrong. This is B1. B1 when it is two, three. Okay, so this must be one. Excuse me, two, two. 3, 1, with, with coefficient 1, 3, 1, so 3, 1, so this is B, 2, okay, 2, and by uh, minus B, 2, and finally B, 3, so 3, in order to have a coefficient number 1, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2. 1, 2, 1, 2. So this is 3. 3 and minus B, 3. Now it is correct. Excuse me. In any case, you see, at least for me, to remember such a formula is very easy. Remember such a formula 
is, as you have seen, relatively difficult, at least for me. Excuse me and see you within two days. How do you think? Shall we continue in this room? Because I prefer it, because the, the table. Yeah? Okay, so next time after tomorrow in the same room. Thank you very much.